So my mother mostly was a very, very serious person. And uh, so on the rare occasions that she actually made a joke, she would say, well, I can be funny, you know. And uh, my reaction was, really? How come I never knew that? Well, there was this one joke that she had. She came uh, to live briefly with us uh, back in 2004. Uh, she moved up to Maine to be closer to us, and she was going to buy property and have a house. But for a while, she was living with us. And uh, the interesting thing is that people observe what other people are doing, but they don't know the reasons why. And uh, they try to come to their own conclusions about things. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Well, uh, Cindy had this system. We had uh, uh, three file cabinets on the third floor. And uh, to hike up to the third floor every time you had some important piece of paper to file, that was something that Cindy didn't do. So she had this roasting pan uh, with a cover on the counter. And when she got important paperwork, she just lift the cover and put the paper into the roaster. And uh, one day, she couldn't find it. And my mother just goes, well, it, it was filed in the roaster where it belonged, wasn't it? You know, and she was being funny about that, because my mother didn't know all about the third floor and having to take, and that Cindy would go up there when she had a roaster full of paper. She'd go up there and she'd do her filing and get that taken care of. My mother didn't know that. She just thought that Cindy had this odd system of filing important paperwork in the roaster. Uh, and so, and, and it might have been an odd system, but it worked for Cindy, and so that's the only thing that was important. But uh, uh, I, I mention that because so often we look at other people and we look at what they're doing and we try to draw conclusions as to what we think that they mean. And unfortunately, because we don't have all the facts, usually, we're wrong. And we're going to see that uh, in the passage that we're going to be looking at today. So uh, the title of the sermon is Spiritual Humility. And in the graphic, you'll notice that the head's been chopped off, and the only thing you can see is the heart. Because humility is not a head thing. Humility is a heart thing. It's, it's what you think and believe about yourself deep down in your heart. Uh, it may at times involve uh, your head to understand things, but basically, it's, it's about the condition of your heart. And the fact of the matter is, you truly can't be spiritual without being humble. If you're proud, you are not at all spiritual. Pride and spirituality just don't go together. They don't mix. And so, hence the title, Spiritual Humility. So, uh, just to give you some definitions about this and why, uh, humility is actually total honesty about what you understand about yourself, what you are and what you aren't, what you can do and what you can't do, what you need and what you desire. The more that you understand about you, the easier it is to be humble. Because if you know that you are a creation of God and that you aren't taking the place of God, that's part of what humility would be. If you know what you can do and you realize that God has built you and equipped you to be able to do some things, but at the same time, he has made you not to be able to do other things. There are things that you really need to depend upon him for and you don't depend upon yourself. You recognize that you have needs and those needs you can't meet yourself. Those needs sometimes can't even be met by another person. You understand that only God is capable of meeting those needs. And that you have desires, and, and one of those desires should be to be known by God and to be able to experience the beauty of God in your life. A person who is proud just simply doesn't think that way about these things. Uh, and, and we're going to be taking a look at that. So we need to know what humility is in order to understand why it's tied into this concept of spirituality. So our key question is, what do you want from Jesus? Why do you follow him? You know, that, that's what uh, Jesus was asking the disciples of John the Baptist when they started following him. Uh, they might not have fully formulated, you know, an answer to that question when they started following. They just felt like, well, this is the one that I should follow. Maybe I need to find out more 
about who and what he is. Uh, maybe I need to find out if he really is what uh, John says he is. So, uh, so he asked that question of them, and that's a question that you need to be asking of yourself. What do you want from Jesus? What is it that you need in your life? Uh, what is it that you desire in your life? What is it that you can't do that only God can do for you? Uh, what are your weaknesses and what are your strengths? You know, these are things that you need to be asking yourself so that you can answer the question, what do you want from Jesus? Our key idea is that humility opens your heart, your soul, and your mind to God. True humility, the understanding of what you are not, what you can't, uh, is going to open your heart to God. And, and that's an important thing because uh, the, the problem is, is that when you're filled with pride, your heart really isn't open to anything that God is doing. And that's something we're going to find in the passage today. So our sermon passage happens to be Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9 and going through verse 14. That's where we're going to be in uh, the Bible today. So let's take a look at this. So in, uh, in uh, verse 9 of chapter 18, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, or I should say the, the person, Luke, who wrote this, uh, is recounting a story that Jesus told. And so he's defining in here the audience that is being spoken to. And he says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. <clears throat> so th this is a story, this is a parable that's being told. It's not literal truth. It's not supposed to be understood as literal truth. It's supposed to be understood as making a spiritual point that we can understand and that we can apply and use in our own lives. And uh, he's telling this story, Jesus is telling this story, and these people had great confidence, and I really highlighted their own, because they were not trusting in God for their righteousness. They were trusting in themselves for their own righteousness. That's what they were looking for. And because they looked at themselves and determined that they were worthy of being righteous, since they had this all under control, they actually scorned everybody else. They looked down their noses. They thought very little of others because they had achieved this lofty thing known as righteousness, and they did it all on their own. They did it by their own intelligence and by their own force of will and by their own strength. They had accomplished this. This was their accomplishment. That's the point that's being told in the story. We need to understand that this is where their head is at. This is where their heart is at. There is no humility in this particular audience. We, we need to know that. Because then that kind of colors the whole rest of the way that the story goes. And so the issue here really is pride. Maybe you've heard people say this. I hear it all the time. You know, do you need prayer for something? No, I'm good. You know, do uh, you need any help with this? No, I've got this. People all the time are just saying, hey, you know, I've got everything under control. I've got everything that I need. I don't need any help from anyone or anything. Everything is good. I've got this. That is the very essence of what pride is. And that is the way people in our world live all the time. I, and I encounter it everywhere. It's even amazing that people whose lives are a total train wreck where everything has gone wrong. Nothing is going right. They have nothing good happening in their lives. It's one crisis after another, and those people will say, nah, I'm good. I've got this. It's like, what are you talking about? Everything is falling apart around you. How can you say that you've got this? But that's the attitude that they take. That's pride speaking when you hear that coming from somebody else. And when somebody truly believes that they've got everything under control, when they truly believe that, that, that they are better than others, then they look at other people with scorn. Because when we play the comparison game, no matter how much our life is falling apart around us, no matter what we don't have, no matter what we haven't achieved, no matter what we've lost along the way due to bad choices and bad decisions, you know what? We can always look at somebody else and say, well, at least I'm better than they are. We can always find somebody who's lower than we are at whatever is our lowest point at that particular 
And, and so what's interesting is once we find somebody who is not doing as well as we think we're doing, then we're in a position to be able to judge them. And that's where the scorn comes in. Well, at least I'm not them. At least I'm not doing this. At least I'm not doing that. At least that hasn't happened in my life. At least I can say, we can always find something that we can use to place ourselves in a better position. So pride is a really important issue in this particular passage. And I want you to look at that. And if you see yourself playing this game at any point in your life about anything, you need to stop and go, okay, wait a minute. What's this pride that's creeping up in me? Why do I somehow feel that I'm doing better than I really am? Or at the very least, why do I feel that I'm better than somebody else? You know, the Bible says all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. We're on a level playing field spiritually before God. None of us is better. We might be able to say, well, at, at least I have not, you know, my life hasn't blown up in this way or that way, and I'm thankful for that. But even if our life hasn't blown up for us like it's blown up for somebody else, we're still sinners. On that playing field before God, we're, we're no better than anybody else, and we shouldn't think of ourselves as being better than anybody else. You know, Christians play this game all the time where they think that, well, at least my church's doctrine and understanding of disputable issues is more correct than that other church's understanding of disputable issues. At least we don't think this way about the end times. At least we don't think that way about something else. At least we know that we're better and we've got things more under control than those other guys do. Christians do that. That's a mistake. That's pride when we do that. And that's something that God does not want in us. He wants us to be united in Christ. He wants us to look at ourselves and say, I'm a sinner, they're a sinner. The wages of sin is death for me. The wages of sin is death for them. Jesus went to the cross to pay for my sin, and he went to the cross to pay for their sin. He rose from the dead and had victory. So therefore, because I believe, I get to have victory. And because they believe, they get to have victory. It doesn't matter how smart I am. It doesn't matter how successful I am in my career. It doesn't matter how good my marriage is. It doesn't matter how smiling and well scrubbed my kids are. None of this stuff matters. The only thing that matters is that we both have the same need for a savior. So therefore, we're on the same playing field. That understanding is humility. That's what God wants from us. And it takes a while sometimes for us to get to that point to be able to be humble enough, to be spiritual enough, to be able to understand that particular truth. So when we get to verse 10, uh, Jesus gives us the setup here. Now the setup is basically there to be able to show the audience uh, that they've got everything as they expect it to be. Uh, and, and it's a setup because they're going to hear what Jesus has to say in this part of the parable, and they're going to be sitting there with their chest puffed out, and they're going to be thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, he's talking about how good I am. That, that's, that's where this is going. I, I know what's happening here. And so he says in verse 10, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other one was a despised collect, uh, uh, tax collector. So these two men go to the temple. So the, the emphasis here is on temple because that's the most spiritual place that anybody can go. If you're a truly spiritual person and if you're spiritually clean and uh, you have the right to stand before God or whatever, then you go to the temple. The, and the Pharisees would have looked at that and they would have said, oh yeah, temple, that's where I go all the time. That, that's what I do because I am a good Pharisee. I am somebody who has been trained and taught and I'm successful and I wear nice clothes and, and I do all of the right things. Yep, yep, that's where I'm going to be. And that's why he says one was a Pharisee. And the Pharisee is going to listen to that and go, of course the Pharisee is going to be at the temple praying. That's what Pharisees do. They're such godly spiritual men that they're always doing things to show how spiritual they really are. They've got all of the evidence all around them. Everybody can see it. Nobody questions it. Nobody doubts it. Hmm. And the other one was a despised tax collector. And so Jesus has to put in this idea of being a, not just a tax collector, but despised. 
th th this idea that uh, this Pharisee is going to a place and there at the same time is the lowest of the low, the person that he looks down his nose at, the person that he doesn't want to have anything to do with, the person that he doesn't want to talk to, the person that he doesn't want to associate with, the person he would never want to help. You know, this is the lowest of the low. So the audience that's hearing this, the audience of people who think that they have made themselves righteous, people who have great confidence in their accomplishment, they're hearing this, so they're already starting off, and they're sucked into this story. They're sucked in thinking, oh yeah, I know exactly how this story is going to go. I know how it should go. I know what to expect. They're, they're just drawn right into it. But then in verses 11 and 12, the story itself begins. And it's very interesting the way he says this. Because even at this point, as he's talking about this, I'm pretty sure that the people in his audience who are Pharisees, those people in his audience who are confident in themselves are listening to this part of the story and they're thinking, yep, this is exactly as it should be. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. You know, when he says that the Pharisee stood by himself, the Pharisee would have said, of course, he stands by himself. He's, he's a man outstanding in his field. He's a man outstanding in his righteousness. Of course he would stand by himself. He has to. How else is everybody going to look at him and see that he is this great Pharisee who is so righteous before all men? He has to do that. He has to stand apart and show off his good clothes, show off his spirituality and the way he prays. He's got to be able to do this so that everybody knows how wonderful he is. And even the prayer that he says, I thank you that I'm not like other people. This is that looking down his nose part of it. And the audience that would be hearing it would say, well, of course, that's what you do. It's like, who wants to be like those people? Who wants to be like cheaters and sinners and adulterers? That's not us. It's not what we do. That's the lowest of the low. They do that. We don't do that. We're above all of that. We are more righteous than anyone else. I've certainly met my fair share of Christians who take on that attitude. They take on the attitude because of the doctrine that they believe, because of the church that they attend, because of the amount of time they spend in the scriptures every single day. You know, all of the things that they do that they think are bringing them righteousness. I've encountered that. Maybe you have too. It doesn't look very pretty. It, it, it's not the beautiful side of the things of God. It, it's really the ugly side of prideful sin that one sees in a moment like this. And then, because this story is about this Pharisee and the tax collector, he says, I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Certainly not like him. Look at that guy. You know, compared to him, what do I do? I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of my income. He's, he's basically getting into the outward signs, the things, the rules that he follows, the things that he is technically obedient in. We, we do that. We tend to think, I've been to church, I've had my daily quiet time, I've, I've had a devotional, I've, I've done my tithing, I've done all of the things that I'm supposed to do, I must be good with God because of those things. Because that's what he's thinking. He's saying, I'm, I'm good because I'm doing all of these things. I've got it really under control. So that's the story. So that audience has been sucked in, they're listening to this, and they're going, yep, it all makes sense to me. Jesus is saying what I think that he should be saying. And then the story takes a turn. It was, but the tax collector stood at a distance, and he dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. Compared to the Pharisee, who made sure that he stood by himself so that all could see him. He was standing at a distance. He was, he was trying to get as far away. He was trying to be in the shadows. He was trying not to be noticed. He, he didn't feel that he had the right to be hanging around other people who were certainly better off than he was. People who had a better reputation in town. People that uh, thought more highly of themselves. People that were thought highly of by others in the community. He didn't, he didn't get near them. He didn't belong near them. 
He would have been embarrassed or ashamed to be near them. He would have been, you know, afraid that somebody was going to point out what a miserable human being he was and say, you don't belong here, get over there. He stayed as far away as he possibly could. But he still was in the temple. And he still was praying. And he was still going before God. But he wasn't going before God because his chest was puffed up. Because he felt good about himself. He was going because he felt horrible about himself. And he recognized that he needed to humble himself before God. That's the reason why he was at the temple. And this description of not even daring to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. I mean, to, to, to do that in, in the ancient world, to be able to, to hold your hands out and to lift up and look up to God, I mean, that was an indication that you felt confident in the presence of God, that you felt that God was welcoming you and that God would be blessing you. That, that is what that stance was meant to be. He wasn't willing to take that stance. He, he wasn't even willing to lift up his eyes. He was too embarrassed. He was too ashamed of what he was. Now, my point here, and I don't think the point of this is to say that we should beat ourselves down, that we should feel that we're the scum of the earth, that we should feel that, uh, that, that we are worthless, that we should feel that we're nothing but worms and dirt. I, I don't think that that's really the point of what's going on here. Some people feel like this is the point of Christianity, is to make you feel as horrible as you can possibly feel. I don't think that's the point. As a matter of fact, I think that that ends up missing the point. The idea is not to beat you down. The idea is not to make you feel worthless. The idea is for you to recognize the gravity of your sin and to recognize that you have no reason to be puffed up about yourself. You have no reason to think that you have accomplished anything. That's really what it is. Humility is, is not feeling like I don't have the right to go before God. It's the feeling of I recognize that I need God. I really need Him. I can't do this on my own. The only way I can do this is if God comes alongside and helps me. I need God. That's really what this passage is all about. It says that, you know, he beat his chest in sorrow. In other words, he looked at the fact that he was a sinner and he recognized that that was not a good thing. That's the picture that he has here. Not that you and I need to go and, and you know, beat ourselves up. We're not supposed to practice like, you know, people have done in the past where, you know, they, they would take whips or whatever and they'd beat their back until it was bloody. That we need to be going up and down flights of stairs on our knees until our knees don't function anymore, that we're supposed to bring as much pain and suffering upon ourselves. That's not the point. The point is how do you, in a story, convey to somebody else that which is unseen? Because humility is not something that we can see and necessarily know about somebody else. We cannot know the condition of another person's heart. Only that person and God can possibly know that. And since the rest of us can't possibly know that, how do you in a story, a parable, convey what's going on inside the heart of the other person? That's really what this is all about. It's to tell us what this person feels in their heart. And this person feels broken, and this person feels unworthy, and this person feels that they need the grace of and the mercy, and the forgiveness, and the love of God. This person recognizes that they have a need. They recognize that they really want to be known by God. That they want God not only just to know every aspect of who they are, but they want to know God as well. They have this need. And he says it in the line, Oh God, be merciful, be merciful on me, for I am a sinner. He is, he's basically now defining what he understands his need to be. His need that he cannot meet for himself. He's defining that. And that's in the story so the rest of us can see that. Now, the Pharisees that would have been hearing Jesus tell this story the first time, they would have said, yep, this guy is worthless. 
yep, this guy, I mean, you know, he's behaving the way he should behave because, you know, he's the lowest of the low. They're, they're still caught up in the story. They still think that the story is going their way. They still feel that they are enjoying the favor of God. That's what they think they're doing. They haven't yet found out that that's not exactly where the story is going. There is this thought that people have. It's, it's a, a very common human issue. It's, it's a part of our prideful sin nature. We tend to look at the externals, and if somebody is blessed by God, then they are going to have nice clothes, they're going to drive a good car, they're going to live in a nice house, they're going to have a lot of friends, they're going to have great kids, the marriage is going to be good. They are going to have blessing upon blessing upon blessing. But all of the things that we tend to look at as being blessings are all materialistic things of this world, which is why the health and wealth gospel is not a good gospel because it focuses on the things of the world instead of on the things of the heart. And it plays to that sinful, prideful weakness that is in every person that if we allow it to take root and to really blossom and to grow, that becomes the center of our life. That was the center of the life of the Pharisees. They used their knowledge of the scriptures they use their position in their society so that they could have the praise of men. The reason why in this story the Pharisee sets himself apart, the reason why he's doing that is because he's not really looking for the praise and honor of God. He assumes he's already got that. He is looking for the praise and the admiration and the honor of God in the world where he lives. He wants what the world has to offer in that regard. That's what he wants. Whereas this tax collector sees that he's already lost all hope of that. Nobody in this world is going to see him as being honorable. They're always going to see him as a despised tax collector. He has no hope of anything better ever happening for himself. So he's not even trying to get that. He's keeping his distance. He's keeping away. He's not keeping away from God, but he's keeping away from other people in the culture around him. He's keeping his distance from that because it's very clear to him that he doesn't measure up and he's never going to have it. One of the things that we need to be doing as Christians is we need to be making sure that the people around us who are downtrodden, who are, have been marginalized, who have you know, had experiences which caused them to to, to think very low of themselves and to make bad choices because of the low of self-opinion that they have. We need to help them understand that in the eyes of God, all of that worldly stuff, it, it doesn't have any credence. It doesn't carry any weight. That when you are in God's presence, God looks at you and responds to you in a completely different way. That if you know why you're seeking after him, if you know why you're following behind him, if you know why you're doing that, you know that like this sinner, you're thinking, God, be merciful on me. I, I, I have no way of solving my problems. I have no way of becoming what I need to be. The only thing I have left, the only thing I can turn to is your love and your grace and your mercy. I need your compassion. I need your forgiveness. I need your strength. I need your encouragement. This is what I need. And I need it today. I needed it yesterday. I'll need it tomorrow. I know who I am. I know what I am. And I know what I need. So this tax collector completely and utterly understands the nature of his need. Which brings us to the end here. And the twist that the audience is not going to be expecting. This is the twist. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said justified. In other words, this person has been made right before God. This person has had their, their, their past history 
wiped clean. They, they've been you know, absolved of all guilt of their sin. They, they, they've been made right. They've been made righteous. The Pharisee, who thought that they were righteous because of their own efforts, he's telling you, you know what? You don't have what you think you have. What you think you have doesn't exist. That's a mirage. It's a mirage of your own creation. <clears throat> and it's not something that God recognizes. You're not as secure as you think you are. But this sinner, well, that's a different story. Why? Because in this sinner's heart, he knows what he's not. He knows what he can't do. He knows what he needs. He knows that he desires after God with all of his heart and all of his mind and all of his soul. He knows that he needs that. You don't need any of that stuff. You, you, you think you've got this covered. You, you, you think you're good. You think you've got this. You don't have this. You don't have what you think you have. The sinner has it. The sinner has it because he's not pretending to be something that he's not. He is owning what he really is. And this is really the power of the Christian life. The power of the Christian life is living a life of complete and total honesty. You don't make any excuses for yourself. You don't try to color and put shades on things and try to alter things from what they are. You look at them as they really are, not as you'd like them to be. God can help make them what you'd like them to be, but you don't. You don't try to put this, you know, in some sort of a way. You, you don't say, well, yeah, I, I, I don't really do that too much. I, I've done it a little bit here and there, but yeah, it, it's really not a part of my life. No. You know, <clears throat> um, I was talking to uh, uh, the brother of a person whose funeral I did uh, who had passed away uh, because of alcoholism. And this brother was saying uh, uh, of him that, uh, you know, he would say that, well, yeah, I, I did do drugs then, and I did do alcohol then, and I, and I did this, and I did... He would say all of these things, but those things don't really count. And the reason why they don't count was because I was setting myself up so that I could get into rehab, so I could get off of this stuff. So I went and I did all of this stuff so that I'd qualify to be able to go to rehab. So that didn't really count as doing it. And his brother was like, no, it counted. Because he was doing it. And he keeps telling himself that this time I did it, it didn't count. And that time I did it, and it didn't count. That's, that's coloring things. That's like when you hear of somebody who uh, you know, is, is violent against uh, uh, women and say, well, I didn't really. But if I did, it was because they made me do it, because they said and did and whatever. And what choice did I have? It was the way that they were treating me, you know, and, 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 and they just, they brought me to this place of rage. They did it. I didn't do it. It didn't count. We, we live our lives as Christians by being as brutally honest with ourselves as we can possibly be. We, we, we live our lives in such a way where we say, no, I'm not doing this because I'm being righteous and holy before God. I'm doing this because I just don't want to do this. It's me that's speaking here. It's me that's doing it. God isn't telling me this. There is nothing in Scripture that can confirm my position. My position, it's me. It's what I want. It's all about me. That is the power of Christianity. Because when we get to the point of saying, I understand it's all about me and it's not God. I understand I made the choice. Nobody made me do anything. I understand that doing this was doing it again. And I'm at fault for what I've done. I take responsibility. I own my choices. When we do that, we put ourselves in a place where God truly can work in our hearts and make a difference. When somebody is still playing the game of somehow shifting the blame and pointing somewhere else and saying it's this, it's saying it's that, but it's not me, that person is living in a world of pride. They're living in the world of the Pharisees. They're in this place where they're saying, I'm good, I've got this, I've got it all under control, I'll, I'll get this. That's pride. That's not humility. And there's no way a person can become spiritual when they're playing that game. So every time a Christian 
plays that game on some level where they're not honest about who and what they really are, they've shifted over from the world of humility into the world of pride. And once they're in the world of pride, they are now in the world where I'm in charge, I know better than what God knows, I can do this on my own, I am dependent upon me, I am not dependent upon God. That's the world of pride. It's a totally non-spiritual world. The world of humility is a completely spiritual world. It's a completely spiritual world because it recognizes how desperate each one of us is for what God is able to do. And that's why the sermon is called Spiritual Humility. It's called that because that's where we all need to be at. And the only way we get that is if we start reviewing who we are and what we're doing and we own it. And if it means in owning it that we have to go to somebody and confess and say we're sorry and ask for their forgiveness, that's what we do. We always try to own things as much as possible, as quickly as possible, and try to make things right and try to restore. That's what the Christian life is all about. And so that's why this man has been justified. He has been justified because he is so brutally honest with himself he has completely humbled himself. And so now God looks at that humility and says, okay, let me help you up. Let me give you what you can't have for yourself. Let me give you a blessing that you don't think you even deserve. I'll do that for you because you know the truth about yourself and you're not afraid to own it and admit it. And that's what it is. So what's our takeaway? The takeaway is we should desire to be filled with the beauty of God. The beauty of God is things like forgiveness. The beauty of God is his strength. The beauty of God is his love. The beauty of God is his compassion. The beauty of God is the way he renews our spirit and fills us with things. Those are the things that are the beauty of God. And that's what we should be seeking. Just like the sinner says, have mercy on me, then we should be asking for mercy. And I've just listed a whole bunch of things that would be under that banner of mercy. The things that we tend to need in our lives. We should desire that. When we desire that, because we know we can't give it to ourselves, that's when God starts to give us those blessings. That's why your desire should be for God and for what he can give you of what he has, which is truly beautiful.